I'm going to welcome Vanessa, Alma, Ilias, and Lesme to dive into how they ended up in Lexington. All right, thank you, Creative Mornings. And it's a real honor to be here, especially with these amazing folks that I've had the pleasure of interviewing over the past year and a half or so. Um, I've collected uh, maybe 17 or 18 so far, and the project is ongoing. Um, and so I wanna start by reiterating uh, part of what Jamie said in the intro to talk about the theme and Ends are unique opportunities in disguise that allow us to make meaning out of our past experiences. And the real secret about the end is that it often contains countless possibilities. And I think that you will hear those things in these stories today that we're going to hear. Um, author Wes Moore once talked about the difference between our jobs and our work and my work is definitely in being a connector or a bridge. And so that's why I started this project, Savor, an immigrant entrepreneur oral history project. Um, I've been able to kind of live out my work through this project in collaboration with the Louis B. Nunn Center at the University of Kentucky. And all of these oral histories will be archived there for, per for perpetuity um, and you know, hundreds of years from now, people will be able to look back at the history of Lexington and realize that our stories are all woven together and um, you know, nobody's story is left out and this is what makes our city really great. So thank you for being here. Um, let's start with you, Lesme. How did a Venezuelan native end up in Lexington, and where did your passion for making pasta come from? Great. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, Vanessa, thanks again for what you do for the community. Uh, we're happy to be here. Um, I'm born and raised in Venezuela, moved to the States in 1998 um, to go to Case Western Reserve University. Um, lived in literally Cleveland, Ohio for about five years. Had the same roommate, Reynaldo Gonzalez, he uh, used to be my uh, business partner. And we lived right next to an Italian restaurant. And we work as we went to school, we work daily making fresh pasta from scratch. And we were the only restaurant in town that was making fresh pasta. So we had lines at the door every single night. So as I got done with the school, uh, my bachelor's in finance, I stayed in Cleveland to work for Mary Lynch. Renaldo moved to, uh, he started working for General Electric, so he got a job in here in Lexington. And um, I remember the first time when he called me very depressed, I don't know anybody in Lexington, come, there's something called the Derby. So I drove, <laughs> I drove five hours from Cleveland to Lexington. Um, the first thing he said, meet me at this place called Red Sevilla. It's a, a Spanish restaurant back in the days. Um, flamenco dancers, sangria, paella. So we, I got there on a Friday night and we started like dancing and floating with a few girls in that <laughs> bar. Well, guess what? He ended up marrying one of these girls. <laughs> so I will keep coming back to Lexington. The last time I came to Lexington was 2008. Um, I don't know if you guys remember 2008. I was working for Citigroup back then, market crash. And I was uh, really fed up with the industry came to visit my friend. He took me to the farmer's market. Uh, we got fresh produce, went to his house. What are we having for dinner? I said, let's make pasta like the old days. Drinking wine and just having a good time. 
as I was making pasta, I was like, man, this is so much fun. I wish I could do this for a living. And that's how Lexington Pasta was born. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Would you tell us um, something you shared in the interview was about, you know, actually beyond that thought, buying a pasta making machine and thinking about going into business and getting your first order yes. and all of the marketing and how you did all of that? So we started with three things. We started with that. How many of you guys have a KitchenAid at home? <laughs> that is not collecting dust. <laughs> okay, that's the difference. Um, so KitchenAid, roller pin, and a pasta quarter that we bought online for $600. And it was $600 is a little expensive because it's an electric one. It wasn't a hand cranking machine. Uh, so we started with those three things. Um, one pan an hour making one pound an hour. How many servings in a pound? Anybody? Four. <laughs> Four servings in a pound. So that's how we start making pasta. So the first restaurant, we were going out to the restaurants, just, you know, we're the pasta guys. Uh, <laughs> we're a new company in town. Um, give, give us a try. We had a, something called the sample pack. So we go to different restaurants. Guess who was the first restaurant that gave us a call? Um, the hottest Italian restaurant in town, Bellini's, back then. And uh, they said, Chef um, Andy Myers, he said, let me have 20 pounds for tomorrow, please. <laughs> and and I, at first I was like, yes, our first account. But by the 19th hour, this machine was making weird noises. <laughs> <laughs> don't stop, don't stop. It's still, it's still alive, it's still a baby, our baby. <laughs> Uh, so after, after a few restaurants in town, uh, then we got into the farmer's market, and then the rest is history. Once we got to the farmer's market, we got the presence in the community, it start, people start supporting what we were doing. Uh, we start opening, a, we got a location downtown across the street from Sayer. We're still there, it's one, one car garage. And then we, after five years being there, we actually got in with Cisco, with Kroger's. Uh, we're right now making 2,000 pounds a week. Okay, uh, we moved to a new location on Delaware Avenue, and we kept the downtown location just for retail shop uh, shopping. Uh, but um, that's what we call pasta garage, pasta garage, because we we came from a from a garage, literally. So wonderful! If you have not tried pasta garage, then please do. You're in for a real treat. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on, uh, just for the sake of introductions, to Alma. Um, Alma actually uh, came to Lexington as a teenager with her sister. They run the business together, the gelato business, and with her parents as refugees fleeing the war in Bosnia at the time. And so um, during our interviews, she talked about the period while they were waiting, and they weren't sure where they were going to end up. Um, what country or even what city in the United States, and they were living in Croatia for a while, um, surrounded by landmines. And so, um, Alma, would you tell us how you ended up here and what it was like arriving in Lexington? Well, thank you, Vanessa, and thanks, everyone, for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, well, um, I came here in 1995, Thanksgiving 1995. Um, originally, I'm from Bosnia, West Bosnia. We, um, in 1995, about 30,000 people just sort of left this one area and decided that they were going to go somewhere else. Uh, and uh, we were one of those families. Um, and so during the, um, after being at this sort of refugee camp for probably about six months, they did settle about 600 people, and my parents were one of those who sort of stayed there and just didn't want to go back and didn't want to, you know, go anywhere but sort of moving forward. Um, and we ended up in Croatia and Pula in Croatia for about 18 months, uh, where we actually got a refugee status, uh, and then uh, we were in the process for going to either Australia, Canada, or America. It was like those three. Um, and so our family, uh, we went to a lot of interviews and, you know, medical exams and all that stuff. And um, so we uh, did get approved to come to the United States. But um, at that time, actually, when, when our uh, traveling sort of uh, was set up, they told us we were going to Denver, Colorado. Um, 
and we had all the paperwork ready for that. I mean, you get these bags and people come with you, so it's not really, you don't really go alone. Um, and we've had all of the documents for that. And um, we came to the United States, uh, to New York, uh, landed there and slept one night. And then the next day, we thought we were going to Denver because, you know, again, the paperwork and everything says Denver, Colorado. Um, and we traveled to St. Louis. From St. Louis, we, our tickets then sort of changed or nobody communicated anything to us. We didn't know where we were going or we were going to Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, <laughs> my dad, um, we were flying over the farms, actually the last plane, and my dad is like, well, maybe the sponsor has some kind of farm here and she just wants to work on it or something. We were just making up, like, why are we now coming here? <laughs> um, we did know of Kentucky for the Kentucky Derby, too. I mean, uh, there was even a little candy in Bosnia growing up or that, you know, so it's like good branding, Kentucky but Derby. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, we just sort of came to Lexington, landed, and there were people waiting for us. Apparently, a fate Lutheran church here in Lexington wanted to sponsor a family, and uh, uh, for some reason, a couple of other ones before us didn't end up coming here, and somehow the paperwork, everything sort of got messed up, and we ended up, or not messed up, but... It worked out. It worked out. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. Yeah. yeah. And what was it like um, actually, you know, getting off the plane in Bluegrass Airport and uh, walking down and stepping foot here in your new home? I mean, honestly, I still remember that being like one of my best days of my life. You know, my sister's here and she knows that too. It's just like people waiting for you. There's hair leader. There were a couple families. They had a translator. Actually, her name was Alma. She was also from Bosnia. They came here before us. So... They explained everything pretty fast as soon as we got there, but um, that that last plane ride it was like, oh, that you know, was com you know, confusing and yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. And so you two, much. Selma, yeah. up there. <laughs> we, love, um, we love that we're here and that we ended up here. However, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, your restaurant is one of my sweet treats that I indulge in way too often, but that's another story for another day. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap. It's very interesting because during our interview, you told me that you worked a lot um, as a teenager. You turned 16 right after arriving here and learned English pretty quickly. And so you were kind of forced into this role as an interpreter, interpreting for the whole community. Uh, working at Fazoli's, you also mentioned that you kind of related more with the adults working there than you did with the teenagers because you had been through so much. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, you talked about the farmer's market. So that's the connection with Lesme's story and, and having to go with your dad and kind of interpret for him. Can you talk about those yes, themes? Uh, absolutely. My dad, um, you know, we're from Bosnia and we grew up around farmer's market everywhere around us. I mean, that's how you shop for fruits and vegetables, really. So um, he, um, as soon as we came here, I don't even know how a little bit after he's like, we have to find where's the farmer's market. We have to find where's the farmer's market here. There's got to be a farmer's market. So he would drag me always in the morning, like 7 a.m. He did figure it out where, and then I would go with him just so, you know, he can buy stuff, translate, you know, money. It's still, there. were, we learned English pretty quickly, but, you know, my parents, it took him a little bit. So, way, um, so see your dad every Saturday morning. He's still going to the <laughs> farmer's market. I mean, if anybody, he's just still. And so even after that really had it, you know, later on in life, I sort of uh, moved downtown and, you know, started going to this farmer's market and taking even my daughter. And uh, she doesn't really like to be waking up that early, too, but I'm like, this will be good, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you actually buy the fresh fruits and things. Yes. Yeah, to definitely. Put in. We, you know, support the farmers and get our fruits and vegetables. This year, we from Crooked Row Farm and some other ones too. And so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's move on to Ilias for a moment. Ilias actually spent many summers um, traveling from Greece to Kentucky because his aunt and uncle were living here uh, through his uncle's job at the time. And so he decided to attend the University of Kentucky and that's what brought him here originally. Um, 
And then many years later, when he opened Athenian Grill, it was like a pop-up tent. And many of you may remember this um, at West 6th and other locations traveling around. And one of the themes that kept coming up when we talked in the interview was about relationships and how critical those relationships were, um, the relationships among the tents and the food trucks, and also the relationships in getting you your first brick and mortar. Would you just tell us about some of those relationship themes and how you got started? Correct. Thank you so much uh, for being here and for, for welcoming us uh, to the panel. And thank you so much, uh, Vanessa, for all of that. Uh, Lexington has been, as far as starting first with ending up, I mean, it has been a blessing in the sky for me and my family for coming here. Uh, from 1996, uh, for uh, uh, two summers in a row, my aunt and uncle invited me to come and spend the summers with me. So the last uh, two uh, years of high school was extremely amazing. I was the uh, cool kid in the school that goes to the United States every summer, right? So I, I, I used that, uh, no question about it. Uh, I was like, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow, come on, hurry up, this is like I gotta pack. So that was, that was an amazing experience already. I think so, so summer 1996, the summer that I came to spend summer with them, uh, I immediately uh, realized that this is the place that I want to be. I want to be in the United States. I, I actually, there is a different education system in Greece where you have to decide from your last two years of high school uh, where you're going to give exam and you're going to be admitted to the specific college. You cannot apply to a lot. We have to give exams and based on that score. So I actually did not try that at all. Uh, I was like, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm leaving the summer of 1998. So I apply already. I was, I was coming here, getting myself uh, educated and get, going to the University of Kentucky and getting the application paperwork and international student and all the paperwork that needs to be completed. I was uh, blessed to, be, you know, to, to, to have them here guide me through uh, having a familiar face. I think so more kind of like of the story of Lesma. We came 1998. It's, it's a lot of similarities. We had somebody that we can depend on. You know, I'm on the other end, it's a little bit different. You know, they had to just bust through the gate by themselves and figure it out. So very, very different. And the, the family connection, actually, Luisa is my father's sister. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and from there, I, I attended the University of Kentucky for almost two years. I, got, I was in the information technology and management information systems uh, field. I got a job offer in Miami that I actually, at, back then, at that time, 20 years old, the job in Miami was the best thing in the world. Uh, so I, I took that, of course, and uh, stayed there for 10 years, uh, actually 11 years. And then uh, around uh, the uh, uh, summer of uh, 2011, uh, came back uh, to support Luisa and, uh, uh, and at the same time uh, decided that this is the place that I'm settling down. And I, I have missed, I, I continued to visit Lexington and I saw the growth and I was actually it was so, so different than 1998, no question about it. And, uh, and, and I always was involved with food, but it was never my career. It was always the part-time job. It was probably a way for me to blow some steam from a corporate life. Uh, of course, my aunt is a, a, a culinary uh, uh, a chef here in Lexington for many, many years, worked with some catering and some horse farms and so forth. So, so I always had the influence, and in Greece, the home-cooked meals, I always had influence of food. Uh, and uh, oddly, maybe seven, eight years into being in the United States, I always was saying to my friends, and being on the corporate field is kind of funny, it was like, I'm gonna, when I do my own business, it's going to be a restaurant. And of course, everybody was like laughing. There's nothing to do with computers and real estate <laughs> and things like that. So uh, we, we started here 2011. Uh, decided that this is this is where we're staying. Of course, financial times were very hard, uh, uh, and being uh, uh, being in Miami, you, the the money goes on high expense living and so forth. So it's, uh, that's was part, one part that I left is that we're not really accomplishing anything here. I'm not really making anything happen. It's just what I, I spend what I make, and this is not the future that I want to do. So I thought like Lexington is a place that can give me uh, the start to, to get something going. And, and, and going to your question very quickly, absolutely it did. I mean, I thought about I want to go in the food industry, but of course there was no money for restaurants, there was no money for uh, renting places and having credit to sign a lease. And uh, one of our friends uh, uh, mentioned and say, what about if you go to West Six? It's this brand new brewery, opened a month ago. They have food trucks. 
And, uh, and I went and she arranged a meeting. All of the West Six owners are there. Some of them brought their wives and kids. I show up, Moussaka, Euros, Pastis, all the sorts of Greek plays. And I had them because they were like, what is this guy selling? I mean, what is this Greek stuff? Uh, so they were impressed and they gave me, they gave me Monday night. That was like, there was like only availability. I could have taken whatever I can take in. I was very happy. Uh, and we started with just a, a camper, a camper grill, like a burner and a tent and a couple of tables and a nice little mini register. And we started, uh, uh, we started uh, there uh, in uh, October of 2012. And it was actually the best uh, start and the best uh, day of my career. We we're so excited with the revenue that day. People are pulling in with a car, coming and drinking a beer. Uh, we know that this is what is, uh, this is going to be. Uh, he got pasta from us the same year too. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting like we we go, but we have a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities. Uh, I was going to the community. How everything happened after that is we develop relationship with each customer that came through the tent in the hot summer days, in the really cold Wessex country boy beer works nights with almost freezing temperature. We committed to be there, and we were there. And a lot of the, a lot of my very good friends and supporters and customers at the restaurants come and say, "I remember that night back in 2013 outside of West Six with 25 degrees, <laughs> and you were there." And we, I came to get it because of your of your commitment on this. And 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 after eight years doing this, I'm not. I cannot lie in front of this audience and say it. I look back on those days, and I don't know how I did that. Mm -hmm. How I loaded up on that, that high truck that uh, there's all the similarities with communities. With my, one, the first vehicle that I used to carry all this, all these boxes and all these tents and all those grills, it now is used by Crack and Boom, another, uh, com another favorite local company that, that, that we were all together and we're all going through this business world together in Lexington. So um, we opened our first restaurant in Chevy Chase. And the point to the, uh, the answer is directly to us is we open them with a community's help. We launched a successful Kickstarter campaign. A lot of those people that saw us on the breweries, a lot of those uh, people that wanted to see us make the tent to a restaurant transition, supported us, bought in advance food that they, or, or, or events or, or anything that we gave up as a reward on the Kickstarter campaign. We raised uh, close to $20,000 uh, and we bought our equipment. Uh, the landlord uh, on that building uh, uh, helped tremendously to get us in there. Uh, I walk in, we found that place. I walk into his uh, office. He threw me the keys. He says, I ate a gyro from you a couple of months ago in the, in the cold weather out on Richmond Road by the hospital. We have rented like a little drive through It was an ATM there before in front of the bicycle shop. <laughs> they took out the ATM, and my idea was I'm going to rent a space. I'm going to get the guys to put some electricity, and I'm going to come here and serve lunch. So, and you were not even looking for a brick and mortar, that you just kind of stumbled upon that opportunity, st right? Stumble upon that opportunity, go take doing an errand for my aunt, and we're talking about all these big dreams that one day we'll have a restaurant if we keep going that way and we keep working hard and saving money and trying to do the best we can do. And then she was like, if you're going to ever open a place, let me show you one place that is here in Chevy Chase that, uh, that uh, it's just tucked away, but it's been always a little kitchen. Successful entrepreneurs have started there, uh, catering businesses and Mary Berlantis and all the, all the uh, people here in Lexington, successful people here in Lexington. And we pulled in for her, she was like, turn over here. I'm like, this is a parking lot. No, no, turn over here. <laughs> we, turn, we turn there and the maintenance crew of the landlord is putting up a for lease sign. That's, that's, uh, it's incredible, Serendipity. right? Well, what are yeah. you doing? Here? We jump off the car. What are you doing here? The place is available. We take it. She's like, take the place down. <laughs> the down yeah. <laughs> we, go, we go really quickly. We go into uh, Lewis's office. That it was in the, two buildings down. And then I'm like, I, he was like, I remember that was the guy that says, throw the keys on the table. Take the keys. We'll figure out the money. I'll help you and support you with my partner to get this place in shape. Uh, and uh, he, here we went on from now. Uh, and with the Kickstarter campaign and continue working hard and packing as many events. Once we had the keys, 
of the place and not really money to do anything with it, then we call all of our other food trucks. Whenever you need a day off, Mark Jensen and uh, all the local tag and all the, all the other places, give us the gigs because we've got to save some money. So all of that happened with the support of, of the construction crew and uh, Matthew Brooks and all 32, then Nomi Design now that is with us with all of the design and all of the construction of the restaurants and uh, everybody did it and says, we are okay, you will, you will open the place, you'll be successful, we we'll see it in your eyes, we we'll see it on your energy and we'll get the money that we need to, to get. So uh, nothing better as far as community support and success than, than what it was for us in the beginning, the first year of our business existence. That's wonderful. And I know that you used the same architect, uh, Nomi Design, Matthew Brooks and that team. You're the best. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little biased as well, I know, Matthew. So, um, well, I feel like we're truly just getting started, but we are also almost out of time. We have a little bit more. And so I want to ask each of you, what is next for you? I mean, you all have big things on the horizon. I've been seeing things pop up on social media. Do you want to kick us off, Lesme? Sure. So once again, um, by the way, September 25th is going to be our 10-year anniversary. It's insane. All of you guys, all of you guys are welcome. We're having a big party at Pasta Garage. Local artists, musicians, um, just, just come on down. Free appetizers and drinks on the house. So September 25th, mark that in your calendar. And you're uh, opening so, in. So we're, we have a one, three, and five years business plan. So what is coming for the next year, uh, we're actually opening a second location of Pasta Garage. One thing that we have realized over the years is that we want to create our own demand. Instead of counting on the restaurants, we want to create our own demand by creating multiple pasta garages in the area. So uh, the idea is, um, even though Lexington is growing fast, I think that we should go out to different markets. So we're going, we've been going to the farmers markets in Louisville for the last five years. So we already have created a presence in the community over there. So we're opening a pasta garage number two in Louisville next year. Next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Within a year, within a year. Excellent. And, uh, and like I said, you know, the business is growing. Um, we have a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the incubator kitchen, Lexington incubator kitchen, where we're helping other small businesses. Uh, I wish I had a, a chance, you know, of something like that when we started the business. Uh, so I saw a need. And right now we have 13 businesses operating at, in our location. Wonderful. Yeah. You just keep paying it forward. And it really is the new beginning. Mm -hmm. The end is the beginning for all of these folks. You're helping them out. How about you, Alma? Do you want to talk next about what's next for you personally or with the shop? Sure. Um, well, Selma and I are still in our one through five year. We opened, uh, let's see here, December 2015. So the first two years have been a lot of learning and what they've gone through before and just figuring things out. Um, uh, she kind of worked alone for a little bit and then I left my job and um, joined her after a year. Uh, next, we're still, you know, we're, we don't have really expansion plans. We're just sort of slow. I call it slow and steady plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're still like getting, you know, perfect for, working still on creating flavors and just focusing on the gelato and craft, you know, crafting flavors really. Um, a little bit um, more this this year and coming year, um, I'm doing a little more events and getting out there. It, for us, it's just a two people operation, so we can't really do big events and go out and do festivals and things like that, but a little more smaller catering opportunities is what I'm sort of being focused on this year and next year um, in terms of catering, weddings, and special gelato pop-up bars and things like that. Um, so kind of staying small still, and but enjoying that. Yeah, yeah. doing it well. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. great. How about you, Ilias? Uh Seems like we have, we have, we are on our eight year or seven and a half years of business. We. Uh, we overcommit to a lot of things, and the amazing team that we have always makes it happen. Uh, we have four restaurants in Lexington. We opened last week downtown, and I think so from all the openings, other than our original location at Chevy Chase, we, we have our heart and soul, and I love that community and the downtown vibe uh, the most. So it has been tremendous the first seven days. We opened in the middle of Burger Week. That made it more exciting than, than anything. <laughs> uh, the landlord and the people living in the building thought we're crazy. 
But uh, uh, we, we have a, a division that works with uh, universities around the area. Uh, it has been the last year the, uh, a very exciting uh, venture for us. Uh, we are part of the local animal product, uh, hundreds of thousands of money going to farms and to production facilities and to meat uh, and poultry uh, here in uh, Lexington and the surrounding uh, counties. Uh, we serve uh, four uh, local universities, uh, when I say local, Kentucky universities like University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, uh, Moorhead uh, State, EKU, around 50,000 meals a week uh, starting uh, actually in about three weeks. Uh, we're looking forward to that, but at the same time, not really. And uh, <laughs> we, uh, my, my mentality has been transitions like a, like a college student again, something so that's more and more energetic and more passionate about that concept because we, we're waiting for the, for the holidays, we're waiting for the spring break, we're waiting for the summer, it's kind of crazy. But all of my team that work with the university business with me, uh, it's adjusted to the schedule. They're planning vacations in June. Now, the, we were seven day a week operation before. We still are with the restaurants, but that uh, has given us uh, the weekend to look forward. Some of the universities were seven days a week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of them we do Monday to Friday only. Uh, so uh, as far as new and what the future as for us is just to continue grow the presence. We're already uh, working on going to uh, uh, University of Tennessee, uh, probably in the spring. Uh, we'll do uh, Cincinnati University in spring also. So we have a couple of schools lined up for the next uh, semester. And uh, we continue to grow our presence on food service and higher education. High energy, the kids are amazing, they love us being there. We have multiple concepts, we keep our culinary skills sharp. We have a Korean concept and we have a comfort concept and a Southwest concept and of course Athenian Grill, no, no question about it in all those locations. And a bakery concept also, just baked goods. So we continue to push and grow that segment that has been very exciting for us. Thank you. Do we have time for any questions from the audience or are we, okay. Yeah, excellent. I was hoping we could. What do you want to find out about? Yes. Thanks so much for your stories. Um, you talked a lot about your successes here in Lexington, but I'm really curious what the biggest obstacle for you was and what made you feel the most supported at that time? Are you directing it to anyone in particular? I'm kind of just wondering in general. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, the obstacles was the very, very beginning, the financial hurdle of starting a business. And that's why I didn't mention a specific point, because the community output support from the subcontractors, from the landlord and staff cover all of those. Of course, on the day-to-day -day operations and an operation that has multiple locations, uh, or has its struggles on a daily basis. We, I feel like I, I, I used to have one brother, uh, and now I have 51 because I have 50 employees and we share our, and we share their concerns and we share their problems and we leave their happy, happy moments and we leave, of course, their sad moments. So that has changed and create challenges. But I will be, I will say, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm definitely the last person in the world that can, can say that it was something as an also awesome. Plus, I came into a warm home and my aunt and my uncle and I had somebody here that, uh, that guide me through the process of 22 years ago. So I'm blessed to say that it was not obstacles business-wise, absolutely on a daily basis, but nothing that would shake me through and, and for me to really to have to fight through, other than the extremely hard, many long hours and work days and so forth. Well, uh, going back to you, um, people ask me all the time, how many hours do you work? Because you're here all the time. So I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I love what I do, so I don't call it work. That's one of the things that I, you know, I've realized over the years. But at the same time, um, the first thing that comes to my mind um, is when we had expansion, going from one car garage to a 10,000 square foot building. Um, we had a lot of planning to do. We uh, partnered up with SBDC, a small business development center. They help us a lot with uh, getting uh, the business plan together, uh, the access loan program where we actually got funding from the SBA. Um, that was a major hurdle that we got. Uh, but not only that, once we plan the moving to the new location, dealing with the city, it was a nightmare. Um, we had everything planned out. Then at the end, 
once bef a week or two weeks before we're moving in, they said, no, you guys need a, a septic tank outside of the building. That was going to cost $50,000. So we're like, oh, my God. So it's, um, it was a really big hurdle for us. Um, it was a really a nightmare. It was like a deal breaker for us, to be honest with you. Um, we got through it. Lucky enough, um, Steve K helped us a little bit um, on that end. Uh, we were able to put a degrease trap inside of the building, which was a 250-gallon grease trap. Um, so um, uh, to answer your question, it was one of the biggest hurdles that we went through and faced uh, having uh, the expansion uh, with Lexington Pasta. The business itself, when we first started, um, we bought a lot of equipment from Italy and all of our gelato machines and case and everything. So there's definitely some of that uh, electricity issues and things I didn't anticipate. Like he said, too, we got to one point and um, then it was like three phase electricity and we didn't have that and it was going to cost somebody said $20,000, somebody's got $15,000. So it ended up in 3,500, so which was really uh, good. Uh, so it, in terms of that opening the store, yes, you know, we did have a business plan and, um, you know, pretty good amount of enough, uh, you know, family money financing. We just did self, you know, financing for this business. And, uh, but things just add up quickly and you didn't anticipate every single thing. And that's that equipment coming from Italy. In fact, still even today, when we need something fixed, we got a person in Louisville that does our equipment. So if, if Jerry's <laughs> too, you know, if he can't get here, we're kind of stuck without yeah. gelato, which has happened last year. I now. wanted you to add about someone crashing into, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the bodega. Um, we, got, we got a call on, on a Sunday night, Sunday midnight. Uh, Mr. Romero, you need to come to your property right away. Um, somebody crashed into your building. Um, Mary Ginocchio across the street, she's calling me freaking out. Let's be, come on, come on, you gotta come right away. So what happened was, the, um, well, as soon as I got to the property, there was a car that landed right on um, the garage door and it got into the building. Um, so we figured out that the guy was actually in a poker game, um, shot the guy on the leg and took all the cash with him and landed in our building. And he <laughs> kept running. Um, so we, we had to stop in. So they condemned the building and we're out for a, about a couple of weeks out from that building. And uh, so we were in a position where we, you know, what to do, right? So we. Lucky enough, we were um, supplying to all these restaurants in town, and so we had a good connection with restaurants owners, so we were able to produce you know, pasta out of their locations. But um, at the same time, um, going back to the incident of the cruise trap, you know, I remember talking to Elias about a Kickstarter campaign. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Kickstarter campaign. We did a Kickstarter campaign with his mentorship, with his knowledge of doing what he has done with the Kickstarter campaign. So we raised $26,000 in a month. And that money that we raised, it went all to the grease trap, <laughs> which is under the ground. We'll never see the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the audience? Yes, the important question is, what is the next gelato flavor going to be? <laughs> <laughs> so, this Selma is like one rule here with our business. I cannot tell her what gelato flavors to make. And she decides literally almost the morning of making it or the night before. She's right there. I don't know. Selma, wait, you got wait any? Wait to us, Selma. <laughs> yeah, there's been, we got some fresh mint. So there's a lot of, there's a mint sorbet and mint other stuff. So. Yeah, usually yeah. posted on their social media yes. daily, yeah, and daily I check post. it pretty yeah. regularly. Yeah. <laughs> Every, Andy, you, you go to Italy and take training, right? That's how you you got interested in starting this. My favorite gelateria worked for him for a month, so, so that, she's the creator of the product. Wonderful. Yes, Alma studied finance and has an yeah, MBA, so, so she does opposite, that end, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> I always say, she makes the gelato, I do whatever else needs to be done. You know? <laughs> so. 
All right, we have time for one more question. Yes, actually, it's not a question, but a command I would like to make. Um, listening to all these success stories, how they uh, came and uh, created their successful businesses, it made me to think from the first question, um, the obstacles, actually their state of mind was not taking the obstacles as obstacles, but opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. We tried to end right around 9.30. I know this was just a tease. You did these interviews, and I think it was an hour which e with each of these, and this was just a sampling. I think you had about 17, 18 interviews that she did with different immigrant entrepreneurs um, around the community. And so, Vanessa, I also really want to thank you for taking on this project. It was so amazing hearing their stories and really highlighting our culinary scene and highlighting our immigrants in the community. And that was, you had a small grant, but mostly a passion project of yours that you did on your volunteer time. So thank you, Vanessa, so much. Thank you, Jamie. And I do want to say that these will be live streamable eventually through the UK Library. And um, I encourage you to tune in. And also, um, I'm still doing this. It's ongoing. So if you know of any others that I should talk to that I haven't, I would love to interview them as well. So again, thank you, thank you. It's been an amazing morning. I always get goosebumps from these. I heard some great um, connections and community and some of the uh, same institutions that helped you guys start the farmer's market, the West Six. And I think thinking back to the end, someday someone's going to say you're the institution that helped start their business. And so mark your calendars. August 16th will be our next Creative Mornings. That will be soon to be announced. And so I like to end with everyone is creative. Everyone is welcome. Thank you so much. Make sure to get your pasta on the way out. Yeah. You guys, thank you. Oh, quick picture.